All right, welcome to Swine Time Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Spencer Wayne. I'm one of the veterinarians here at Pipestone. And with me today is our guest, Dr. Scott D., also one of the veterinarians here at Pipestone. He has a very different role than what I do, which is basically get manure all over me every week. Scott, maybe he also does that, but he thinks about things more than I do. He's a, he's a scientist. Yeah. So I will uh, turn it over to Scott. Scott, we got a, some good information to cover today and an update on research you've done. Uh, but why don't you just set it up and tell us who you are, um, what you do here, and anything about yourself you think should be known. Sure, sure. I'm Scott D. I appreciate this opportunity. I like these podcasts a lot. They're really well done. Uh, I'm the, as you mentioned, I do a little bit different work than you do, although we're trained a lot the same. But I'm the director of applied research. I've been here for 10 years. Uh, I live in Alexandria, Minnesota, and I have uh, my wife and I have two kids. So that's a little bit of background and a brand new Scottish Terrier puppy. Great. Yeah. Did you have to replace one or was this a... Yes, a my, my wonderful baby died at 12 years uh, back in October. So we brought a new one in now. And so she's four months. And so if I look a little be beleaguered, I probably haven't <laughs> slept a lot lately. That's why. Great. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, the topic today is feed disease feed risk. I guess if I can just say it in one statement. Disease feed risk, uh, how to manage it, mm -hmm. and what we know. Does that be fair? You bet. My okay. favorite topic. So for the audience listening, if you go back in the podcasts that are published, it was probably a year and a half ago, something close to that, that mm -hmm. we maybe even longer, that we were recording together at that time. We knew early stuff. Uh, it related to African swine fever, to PED, those two things in feed and the potential for feed to transmit those, transmit those two viruses. Really early on, we didn't we didn't know much. We knew to be scared at that point, probably. But since then, we've discovered more about how to mitigate it, how to reduce mm -hmm. the risk, um, how easy it is to transmit. Um, I don't know where you want to start on that, but you've done so much, you can just take it away and describe what you've done, understanding those things since then. Sure. So first of all, a lot of credit to several people. This is work that's been done not only at Pipestone, but also at South Dakota State University, Kansas State University, Cornell University, Plum Island off the coast of New York. Now this is a very, very large group of, of scientists working together to study the risk of viral survival and viral transmission in feed. So it's gone from PED to ASF, now to hog cholera, to pseudorabies, uh, foot and mouth disease virus will be coming down the road into some of our assessments. So it's just an amazing body of work that's grown exponentially in the last year or so since we spoke. Okay, to kind of frame up the risk before we even get to how to, to reduce the risk, these viruses can be transmitted in the feed. Um, to different levels, but essentially they all got, they've all got potential for going through the feed into an animal and infecting that animal. Is that correct? Yes, they all survive in feed based on the work we've done. So again, PED, uh, hog cholera virus, pseudorabies virus, African swine fever virus, just as starters. That's PERS and Seneca too. Yeah. So this is a, this is a very, very large group of viruses. They, they live very well in feed and they can be transmitted through consumption of feed. So that work has been done again and again and again. And so it's almost like a, this big pile of evidence we have now that the feed is a risk. It's a new risk factor we've never thought about, uh, but we have to pay attention now. Okay, in that, when I watched your results come in, it's not just feed, it's the ingredients and it's the specific mm -hmm. things that go into feed. One thing, it seems like it's popped up a lot, is soybean meal. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comments on how reliable that is as a specific risk ingredient compared to the others? That would be uh, number one, uh, based on not only what we've done again, but it's a very repeatable result across all these laboratories I've talked about. Every time we take a virus and we test it against many different ingredients, that's the one that's most protective. So the virus not only survives over time, but the quantity of virus doesn't change much over time. Typically viral load will drop over time because it's just sitting there. But in soybean meal, for some reason, the tighter or the level remains high. Now, I don't really know why, Spencer. It's maybe it's plant protein with high, high protein quantity. I'm just guessing. I've talked to a lot of nutritionists, and nobody really knows why. But it's very repeatable, very consistent observation. So it's got to be number one risk ingredient for movement of viruses from country to country, or if a virus got into our country from farm to farm through feed. Okay. Good background. For the stuff you've done here, 
we have a barn called uh, Research Barn 6, RB6. <laughs> And it's not like our other research barns. It's it's smaller and it's way more controlled for studying more dangerous things, is the way I'd kind of describe mm -hmm. it. Can you just talk about how we study things that might reduce viral load in feed? So we got contaminated feed, we put something in, and then we see if it works or not. Can you describe how we do that? Sure. So before we do that, it's important for the audience to understand when we're talking African swine fever, pseudorabies, hog cholera, those viruses aren't being tested here in Pipestone in our BSL-2 facility. Those are being tested down at Kansas State University in a much higher security facility called a Biosafety Level 3 facility. That's where Megan Niederwerder and I started working together because I can't work with those viruses for obvious reasons here in the countryside. So don't anybody be concerned that we're actually you know, spike and feed with ASF on the backyard kind of thing. That's not what's happening at all. But the barn we're able to work with, we call Biosafety Level 2, it's got six individual rooms that have filtered air in and out with uh, coveralls and boot changes in and out. So you can have various treatments by room and you can have control groups by room and you don't get cross-contamination. That's the beauty of that facility. Yeah. That's, thanks for clarifying. When I said dangerous things, I meant like PED and PERS. Yeah, which are well, dangerous they're enough. dangerous. They're dangerous, yep. Yeah. Yeah, but, no, but not the point. foreign animal diseases. Right. We're not doing right. that here. In that facility, in our facility, we're working with Seneca virus A, which is a great proxy for FMD. It's kind of the same family of viruses, but it's not FMD. And PERS, as you said, and PED. So that's kind of the three viruses I work with. PED was the original virus that came from China in feed. That's a discovery we made. Uh, PERS virus is a unique observation that it can live in feed and be transmitted. And then, and then uh, Seneca, as I mentioned, is the, uh, is the surrogate for foot and mouth. So yeah. it's a nice threesome to work with. Okay, so that barn, it's got feed bins outside. I'm going to screw up describing it, so correct me. Um, but basically, you put clean pigs in to a room, then you feed them, feed through an auger that comes out of a bin. But that bin, you basically drop a nuclear bomb of frozen virus in an ice cube into that bin and let it permeate through the feed, get to the pigs, and then watch how the pigs react to it, if they get infected, and how sick they get, those type of things. Is that correct? No, that's, that's very good. The, the variable in that equation is the, the feed is treated with an additive that we're trying to study to see if it's got antiviral effects. Can it reduce infection? Can pigs do better clinically and production-wise when they're eating a mitigated feed? And we can also have a control diet. We can have one room that receives feed with absolutely no mitigation. Uh, but we, as you said, we drop a standardized amount of virus, Seneca, PERS, and PD in an ice cube, basically, and let nature take its course and let the viruses move into the rooms through the feed system. So we're trying to reproduce what happens in the real world. Okay. How many products, these mitigants, the things that mm -hmm. should kill the virus in the feed or slow it down or somehow hamper its effect to, to affect pigs. How many have you tested? Probably by now, Spencer, we've done close to 20 different products. It's okay. very interesting. And outside of one product, the remaining products have shown consistently that p help pigs remain at a higher level of health when on a mitigated diet. They grow faster, fewer die, versus the control group, which without any treatment, any mitigation, Pigs are getting sick with PERS, they're getting sick with Seneca, they're getting sick with PD. It's amazing how well the pigs have done, almost independent of the mitigant type, when they're on a treated diet versus a non-treated diet. Yeah, you know, every couple months there's new results that you're kicking out mm -hmm. to the group and I'm looking at it and every time it shows that if they're treated, they may even show the virus is there, they might mm -hmm. even show that they're infected, but they do so much better it must be really slowing the virus down and the damage the viruses tend to do compared to the controls that are no, no protection, they just get exactly. slammed. Yeah, the, the mitigants, we don't really know why it works. The chemistry of the mitigants, we've tried many different types. We've tried acids, we've tried formaldehyde-based, we've tried medium-chain fatty acids. Those all seem to work very, very well. We, but we don't know how. We don't know if it's because it kills the virus, because like you said, you can still find fragments of the virus in the treated feed, even in the pigs sometimes, but they don't get sick. Maybe it enhances the immune system. Nobody really knows why they work. The one consistent observation is, for the most part, they work. But we're trying to work on the cost, because that's going to drive usage, as always. It's hard to pay $60 a ton. It's almost like an insurance policy. You don't know when you're going to get infected, but if you do, 
it's a good thing to have, but yeah. it's very hard to predict. So can we get the cost down and still have, make it work? And then, then producers, I think, would have a good justification for adding it to their budget. Okay. Um, you're a research guy, and I'm a, a vet out there, and then we have a whole production team that's not in this conversation, but our, our production team looked at your research, mm -hmm. and we after a few purse breaks that were really unexplained, uh, mm -hmm. we, we had in some of our farms in very remote spots this fall, we went ahead and put one of these products in. Uh, one of the uh, it was because we couldn't use salt curb, we used one of the powders, and so one of these uh, medium chain fatty acid products went in to our across our system. Uh, well, maybe just to the highest risk locations to protect us. That's is that fair? I mean, I think that's accurate. We did that this fall. We yes, we actually used a product called Guardian that we developed, and we sold it to a company called Alltech. So I have a conflict of interest. But we, that was a decision the health team made because of cost and because of safety and because of data. We had a lot of data on that product, and we, the, the health team felt that that was the best option for now. And it was like you said, farms were getting infected with PERS way out in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. and they'd been negative for years, and all of a sudden they're infected. And we've been showing through these studies the repeatability of infecting pigs with PERS virus through the feed. Okay. So that gave the vet team enough confidence and said, hmm. Let's try it. Let's measure it, be sure it works. If it doesn't, we'll change course. But it basically went across the system, at least during the high-risk disease season. Yeah. A lot of the questions I would get when we would show your results, people would say, well, what are, you, what are you guys doing to the south farms to use this information? And for a long time, mm -hmm. it was nothing because we don't directly c control the feed manufacturing. Right. But when we had these breaks, it was, it was kind of like we had to do something. So it went in. So we have used them. Um, and... We haven't had as many purse breaks since, but who knows why? It may be yeah, related to that. Time will tell, but we're measuring it. Okay. Uh, shifting gears entirely, back to feed risk, um, ingredient risk, maybe coming from other countries. So we, we bring in ingredients from other countries here, especially things like amino acids and vitamins mm -hmm. from China, some soybean meal from China, mm -hmm. uh, other things, maybe other, other countries in, uh, are exporting to us as well. Tell me about the politics involved in that and how your research has affected what other countries have done for their own border protection and what we've done mm -hmm. for ours. Anything you have for comment on that? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. That's kind of where the it all hits the road, right? It's, if, if no one does anything with it, then it's just wasted, dusty old manuscripts. But I'm happy to say that there's been a lot of application at the U.S. level driven by the industry on how we manage high-risk imports, but also globally now across uh, Australia, Canada, and Europe. So there's a lot of moving parts now. People are recognizing the risk of feed, and countries and continents are putting plans together. Um, Canada, Australia, and Europe will be government-driven programs, most likely. Well, Canada is and Australia is. Europe just announced that uh, their, their European Feed Safety Authority just announced that the feed risk is a low risk but cannot be ignored. It, the consequences are too high if ASF got in through feed, so they have to do something about it. That's how the Canadians and the Australians thought too. We haven't thought that way, from at least from the regulatory side here in the United States, which I'm sorry to say. The, the industry's taken the bull by the horns and gotten some things going. But I'm disappointed so far that there's been no activity at the level of the USDA or the FDA. Yeah, I know, speaking to you, you've been frustrated with like the lack of, of understanding this and doing something about it. What would you do about it? Like, what are Australia doing about it, Europe, uh, Canada, other countries, if they receive the information and say, we've got to do something, is it just more quarantine period, restricted access? What, what would a country even do? Yeah, what, uh, what's really been good, I think, is knowing the banning things you know that's where you run into trade issues is yo I'm not gonna bring in soybean meal from your country because you got ASF well that's gonna cause all sorts of trade implications I understand that but what these countries are doing is they're just controlling the introduction meaning that they will go to the manufacturing plants where the products are produced and audit the manufacturing plants they'll require certification for the product kind of like, almost like a health paper for your breeding stock. And then they'll put it kind of in a quarantine. Just again, just like breeding stock, to put the products in a holding area for a period of time at a, a consistent temperature to make that viral load just start to decay. Because unless it's frozen, the virus is not going to remain viable and consistent in its quantity. It's going to go down over time. 
That's how you do this. You don't go banning things. You just put a program together to control the importation rather than just helter-skelter, in it comes and off it goes. That's how the world's changing now. So and that's what I'm hoping the U.S. would do. The U.S. would take the pieces from all these programs and put together a program for the U.S. Okay. Because Canada's doing it. We, Mexico needs to do it too. We have to do this as a continent, not just one country. Right. So you just said two things that you could do. And one is go to the source of origin, the, the, the plant making the soybean meal or the vitamins or the lysine or the, any other amino acids. Make sure they're doing the process correctly and they're careful. Mm -hmm. And then let it let it just basically dry out and die. If the viruses have a chance to die by a quarantine period here. Those two things. Right. Not talking about treating anything yet. Just carefulness just and quarantine. Yep. We've, in Pipestone, we've got a really nice program called Responsible Imports that uh, the idea was from Luke Minion. He said, how do we safely introduce products that we don't make in the United States or they're, they're so cost beneficial for our farmers? How do we bring them in safely using science? And so we started having this idea of, of holding time. We, we start studying the virus over the course of the travel from country to country. How much time is it on the ship? How much time do we need to hold it? And we're putting all that together and we're kind of hoping that that viral load continues to decline. Roger Cochran, our director of feed mills, and Arkin Wu, one of our PhD nutritionists, have set up a program working with a company called Sam Nutrition, <coughs> Sam Nutrition out of Minneapolis, that brings products in for us from China. And so Arkin will go to China and audit, and Roger is auditing the facility at Sam Nutrition in Minneapolis. And so it's this beautiful science in an applied way that safely brings in products that we, we either don't make here or there's such savings for the producers that we have to do something about that. And I'm very proud of what's happened here in the company based on what everyone's done collectively, all coming from this little idea of viruses living in feed. Yeah. So to illustrate how that might work, uh, feed mill's going to use lysine, for example, mm -hmm. from China because it's way cheaper mm -hmm. and a lot of cost savings. Um, you guys basically know the plant that, that it comes from. Yep. Uh, it comes to the, to the U.S., it goes to the feed mill, you give it more appropriate time to sit down, and so you've got the time, you've got the carefulness, and then it gets put into a diet going to one of our sow farms. So literally, that is it. You're, the, the sows in the unit are protected by carefulness and time, mm -hmm. those two things. And that's going on at all of our sow farms, or just some, or how, how yeah. widespread is it? Yeah, in our system, it's going on universally. Okay. So we've got, we've got this program that we're bringing in these materials. Uh, you know, we're doing other things like using one-time totes, sealed containers that don't get opened until they come to the storage facility at Sam Nutrition, those types of things too for quality control and biosecurity. Then they're going to the various mills. That's where the mitigants get added. And so this Guardian product that we talked about a few minutes ago mm -hmm. is also put on top of that. So it's about as good as you can get it, as far as what we know today or what you can do. Uh, but it's a, you can see it's a combination. It's science driving the thought. It's good biosecurity practices on feed. And then it's additional layers of protection, like storage, as well as uh, mitigation through additives. Okay. Scott, I think we beat it to death. <laughs> Maybe not. We, we, we sure close. chewed it up a lot. Yep. Um, have you got any final comments that you'd want to leave with our listeners on where you want to go with this in the future, what your thoughts are, what life might be like in a year or two, mm -hmm. following up on this in the same area? Yes. Uh, I just wrote a position statement for the American Association of Swine Veterinarians, which was passed the other day, saying that for the risk of feed to be properly managed, Mexico, Canada, and the United States have to work together. They have to have a program across the continent. Now there's a line in the sand drawn, and the veterinarians are saying, this risk is real, and we have to do something about it. Not just in Canada, not just the U.S., but all three countries. And so there's efforts now to move that forward. So I think that's a big, a big step forward. It's, it's hard to get a group of veterinarians to agree, right? Everybody knows that. This time I think we've got it done. We've got the, our association, our professional group agreed to this position statement. Really? That's yep. sometimes difficult because it's difficult. whatever the issue is, there's like a hundred opinions on yep. it. So if everybody thought that was important enough to put a position statement together, great. Yep. It went through the board of directors about two weeks ago and it was unanimous. And so all the, including the Canadian director, the Mexican directors, and all the U.S. directors from the, the pig vets 
everyone thought that it was a good thing to do. Okay. Scott, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. We'll have to have you on again sometime. Guy, a few months ago, you said, I'd love to do this podcast again <laughs> because uh, you had so much more to share. So yeah. I'm glad you were yeah, here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks to our listeners for being part of this. And uh, join us next time on the next episode of the Swine Time Podcast here at Pipestone. Thank you. Swine Time Podcast was created for the pork industry and individual pork producers around the country. Hosted by Dr. Spencer Wayne with the Pipestone Veterinary Services, the podcast contains pork industry news, advancements in animal care, and how to enhance your productivity. Monthly podcasts are available on Spotify, Google Music, iTunes, Anchor, and on www.pipestone.com.